And he went on to say, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executed righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He's not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitted his children, so does the Lord pity them that fear him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Then the word of God just, it's just wonderful. It just moves in his spirit. Amen, amen, amen. We thank God for everyone that is here this morning. We thank God for those that are watching us on live stream. We thank God for you, you, and you that are here this morning. Let's give our choir another hand. Amen. Amen. We were a little bit weary. Now, we haven't given up on getting a musician. We're just in the search of a musician. But the Lord shows you sometimes when you hear those words without the music, it, it touches down on the inside of your heart. Amen. We just thank you, God, for everybody that is here. Happy Resurrection Sunday to everyone. Amen. I, I know the question, is there a word from the Lord? And there is a word from the Lord. If you've got your Bibles with you, you would go to the 24th chapter of Luke. And I'm going to read verses 27 through 32. Luke, the 24th chapter, starting at verse 27. And for those that are able, if you would stand for the reading of God's word, And the word of God reads, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded upon them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village, whether they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass, as they sat at meat with them, that he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, uh, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us? He talk with us by the way and while he opened to us the scripture. If you bear with me, I want to take a closer look at that 31st verse and it says and their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. I want to say to someone that we need to take on that same uh, attitude, Lord open my eyes that I may see Jesus right where we're at. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us, Lord. We thank you that you woke us up and started us on our way. Lord, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the anointing that's in this house and upon me these lips of clay. Lord, bless me that I speak this word with excellence, accuracy and boldness, asking that you think through my mind, speak through my lips, and this word will come forth unhindered, unchecked, 
by any outside force, and we give you all the praise, call it done, and fully expecting signs, wonders, and miracles, confirming the word in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Lord, open my eyes that I may see Jesus. For those that are familiar with this particular scripture, what I read was the back end of the story. Uh, the front end of the story is uh, about the road uh, to Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus. And it's the story about two disciples, two followers of Jesus, not, 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 now, not one of the 12 disciples, but these were the other disciples that followed Jesus. And they were going to a city called Emmaus. And as they walked, the Bible talks about how Jesus started walking with them. When we look at this particular scripture, we have before us this morning one of the most vivid and insightful accounts of the Lord's appearance after his resurrection. Luke is the only one of the four gospel writers to include this story. It is the story that reveals to us not only something about who we are, but how Jesus opens our eyes to see him for who he is and, and about how we can come to know him. Uh, for those that remember, a couple years ago, uh, my prayer was a scripture when I would open up the preach. And it would actually, it, it's actually found in Ephesians, the first chapter, the 17th verse. And it reads like this, that the Lord, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of his glory of the inheritance of the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. Lord, open their eyes that they may see you and understand your greatness, Lord, what, what you can do. When we look at this particular scripture, the application part of it is that you have to see Jesus for yourself. Uh, a lot of people will tell you about Jesus, but you have to see him for yourself. The journey to Emmaus is both a literal and a spiritual journey. Uh, on one hand, it recounts the story of two disciples who, after the crucifixion and the resurrection of our Lord, walked seven miles from Jerusalem to their village of Emmaus. Jesus had a way of opening our eyes. He, he shows up when you least expect him. Uh, according to the story, two of Jesus' followers heard early reports about the resurrection but didn't take it serious enough uh, to, to change their plans and not leave Jerusalem. But they traveled seven, uh, uh, seven miles to the city of Emmaus. The stories were flying about Jesus. Some say that he was alive again. Some had seen him. Some had touched him. Some had eaten with him. And he was in one place and then suddenly several miles away in a different place behind a locked door. When you look at uh, what happened, the Bible talks about Mary, Mary Magdalene and other women, that when they went to the tomb, that they found that the stone had been rolled away. And there was an angel standing and he says, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. And that's in Luke, the 24th chapter, the 5th and 6th verse. But when you look in Matthews, the 28th chapter, around the 8th verse, it said he has risen. And can you imagine that disbelief? It was too good to be true. He says when they, uh, they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring the disciples' words. 
with fear and great joy. Can, can you imagine that? That they were scared, but also they knew that he's up. He's risen, just like he said. When, when you look in the book of Mark, around the 16th chapter, the Bible says that the angel said to them to do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before them into the city of Galilee. There you will see him as he said unto you. It isn't it interesting the way uh, Matthew and Mark says it? He, he's telling them to go leave here and I want you to go into Galilee and, and I'll meet you there. Uh, the scholars speculate that the reason Jesus sent them into Galilee was that that's where the greatest number of his followers would be. So when he, when you look at the scriptures, Jesus knew exactly what he wanted to happen. I want to go where the most people that know about me, when they see me, they'll, they'll give their testimony. See, this lines up with what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. He says, For I have delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, that how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then the twelve, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greatest remain until this present day. But some have fallen asleep. And he said, after that, he was seen by James and then the 12 disciples. But the Apostle Paul says, more than that, he was seen of me. I, I saw him. And as we get into our text, uh, I read verses 27 through 32. But to really understand this particular text, we've got to go back up to that 13th verse. And it says, Behold, that two of them went the same day to the village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, three score four furlough, which is about seven miles. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they uh, commune together and reason that Jesus himself drew nigh and he went with him. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. He, he, the Bible talks about sometimes God has to put scales on your eyes that you really can't see uh, what he's doing for you. See, we, Jesus sees us, y'all. He, he says, knock, and she'll be open. And I, I'm looking for you. Come, let, let me in. And although the, the disciples knew who Jesus was, they did not recognize him. And they knew a lot about him. See, they were, they were witnesses to when he healed the sick, when he made the lame to walk. When he gave, they, they, they actually saw it. But, but right now, for some reason, the Bible says that God did, did not want them to recognize him. See, God has to work some things in our life sometimes that he has to put scales on your eyes that when you really see him move in your life and, and you think about it, see, you know it wasn't nobody but God. But, but if you think you figure this thing out, see, his, his gradual revelation of himself allowed them to learn certain lessons about trusting the promises of God. See, that's what God does. Sometimes you, you can't see how things are going to work out. You, you don't even know. And it just looks like everything is about to fail. It looks like that you're going to die of this disease. It looks like that you're going to... But then when he removes those scales... And you see Jesus for yourself. See, the, the disciples had been told about these events many times. Jesus said, I am going to be put in the hands of evil men, and they're going to kill me. But, but when the events happen, 
See, when they arrested Jesus in the garden, that wasn't what they expected. When they took him up to a hill and crucified him, it didn't work the way they thought it was going to work. See, they had perceived, uh, preconceived ideas of who Jesus was, and he had to come, um, and what he had come to do, and how he should do it. But when things did not turn out like they thought they should, they dismissed the whole thing as a mere failure, a mishap, um, a misplaced hope, a trust in somebody else. That's the way we are sometimes, y'all. When, when things don't work the way you... See, some people even say, I don't even know why I go over there at church. Don't look like things are working the way it should be. It looks like, and you've heard this, that some people say, it looks like things got worse since I've been serving God. But, but while God always has a plan, we're not always privy to the plan. See, I'm telling somebody today, you going through something, and you can't see how it's going to work out. But see, God is working in your life even right now. But he has, you can't see it. But he's going to work. He's got a plan for you. When you look at these disciples, they had that little faith. They didn't have the faith that they really needed. See, they heard the reports of the women that when they went to the tomb, that they found the tomb empty. And they, the, the Bible said that they went in and looked for themselves, the women. And so they came back telling everybody that, that it's empty. He, he's risen. And see, what we have to be careful about is that just because we don't understand something, or we can't explain it, that, that you got to understand that you don't make the mistake like these two disciples that said, well, it didn't work. And so now I'm moving on. These two disciples knew something had happened, but it was beyond their level of faith to see the things that, uh, that truly were. Just because they knew about Jesus, don't mean they knew Jesus. And he said unto him, uh, Jesus said unto them, uh, what manner of communication are these? And, and, and he said, why, why are you so sad? And the Bible said that the one that was named Cleophas, he answered him and said, Are thou a stranger to Jerusalem? Didn't know he was talking to Jesus. See, what he was really saying is, Where, where have you been? <laughs> have, have you heard what has happened? And, and he goes on to say, And has known the things which have come to pass in these days. And Jesus said, What things? He said, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth which was the prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how the chief priests and all the rulers the, the rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and they crucified him and he said but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel and besides all this listen to this today is the third day since these things happened. See, it, just like he said, on the third day, he, he told the, the Pharisees, he said, if you destroy this temple, I'll build it up in three days. And that's how we get into our scripture. Because he said, and then Jesus, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And after the two disciples had explained their sadness and confusion, Jesus responded by uh, going to the scriptures and applying it to his ministry. See, when we, when we get puzzled, y'all, or uh, questions or problems and we don't know, the scriptures. See, somebody will say, you know, well, what do I do? You just open it up and start. Even if you do that. Even if you just open the book to wherever it falls and start reading, the Word of God has a way of touching on the inside. That's why the Bible said that the Word of God is quick 
and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts going in and it cuts going. Some kind of way it's going to get. Lord, open our eyes that we may see Jesus. And Jesus begins with Moses and from all the prophets. And while we do not know specific passages that Jesus used, we know that he opened to them the scriptures with a view towards showing them how the Old Testament pointed to him in the fulfillment of the prophecy. See, Jesus may have begun with Isaiah, the seventh chapter, where he says, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. He may have pointed to Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, where it says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee and of thy brethren. He, he may have went back to Isaiah around the 53rd chapter, where it says, Who has believed our report? For he shall grow up before him a as a tender plant, a root out of dry ground. He is despised and rejected, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. But I like the fact that he didn't stop there because he says, all oh, we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. All that stuff you've done, all that low-down, dirty stuff, when you lied, stole, cheated, and did everything, God took all that iniquity and laid it on Jesus Christ. When Jesus was going through the scripture, Jesus wanted them to see that if they would just only believe what the scripture said about him, they would understand why he came and why he had to suffer. The scriptures give testimony of who Jesus is. He uses it even today to open the eyes of those who do not know him. When you get into the scripture, what he was saying, when you look at that, the Bible said that he began with Moses. And for the saints and the Bible scholars in here, you know that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. So he started at the very beginning. He said, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone raises from the dead. In John, the first chapter, he said, Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. In John 1, correction, John, the fifth chapter, he says, for if you believe Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. Many people will try to tell you about Jesus Christ. They'll tell you that he's a way to get to heaven. They'll tell you that he was a good man, that he was a great prophet, that he was a good teacher. They'll tell you that he rebelled and defied the Roman authorities. But outside of a knowledge of the scripture, you will never have a proper understanding. You got to get into the word of God so that you'll know about Jesus. The scripture tells us the truth. See, when you get into the scripture and you start reading, what he does, he reveals things to you. Now, somebody may or may not caught this, but in the scripture that I read this morning, the Bible said that when he sat down with the two men, when they sat down at me, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. The Bible said, and their eyes were open. For some of us, you've heard that before on Communion Sunday, that he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he said, this is my body, broken for you, eat in remembrance of me. Yeah. It was only as through fellowship. And that's what I'm telling you. Sometimes that you just got to make up in your mind and say, I'm going to start fellowshipping with Jesus. Sometimes you got to lay things aside, get your word of God, and go sit in a closet by yourself and say, I want to see Jesus for myself. I don't want what somebody's going to tell me. I don't want what I read, what somebody wrote. 
in a book. But when you get into the word of God, you will see things change in your life. When you go back and read that particular story in the Bible, you'll see where they ended the conversation by saying to each other, did not our hearts burn within while he talked with us by the way and while he opened up the scriptures to us and our eyes were open? you got to understand that there's some things that you don't believe right now. You know people that don't believe, but you've seen Jesus for yourself some, and tried to explain it to somebody else. Some things you can't explain. You can tell people about Jesus what he's done in your life, how he's made a way out of no way when you didn't know which way to turn, that you call on the name of Jesus and he made a way. And they still said that I don't believe it. I won't believe it until I see it for myself. The Bible says, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And the disciples came and said, we have seen the Lord. But he said, except I see the nail prints in his hand and put my finger in the nail prints or put my head in his side, I will not believe. The Bible said that eight days later that they were within the house and Jesus appeared and the door being up. The Bible said that Jesus called out and said, Thomas, reach hither. Put your finger in the nail print of my hand. He said, take your hand and put it in my side. The Bible said that Thomas looked up and he said, my Lord, my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. But blessed are they that have not seen me. And he told him to go 
go wash in the pool of Siloam. Yeah. The Bible said that he did go and he washed and he came back singing. And, and, and the Bible said, but when the Pharisees and the Sadducees saw it, they, they called his parents in and say, how is this? Uh, was he blind? Uh, how is he? They said, we don't know. But when he's of age, let him speak for himself. And when they called the young man in, the Bible said that the Pharisees said, give God the glory. For we know that that man is a sinner. But see, here's what the young man said. He says, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. But here's what I do know. Whereas I was blind, now I see. See, sometimes God got to take you through something. And then when he brings you out, it don't matter what other people say. I know that he brought me out of that situation. He'll do it. He'll do it. We got to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As I hear about, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. We thank you for your darling son, Jesus Christ, how he died on the cross for our sins, Lord. Lord, we ask right now that there may be some watching us that right now they don't know, they're up in the air. But I just ask that you touch their hearts and their minds and let them know that we can't make it without God that we need to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and on the third day that he was rose again. Lord, we believe in that because one day we won't see him for ourselves. And Lord, we just believe it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just say to those that are watching us on live stream that uh, we'll have our prayer call on Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock and then again on Friday morning at 6 a.m. And then back here at 11 o'clock on next Sunday morning. So hope to see you. Amen. And again, happy Resurrection Day. Amen. Amen.